that we have a live audience and a Zoom audience. And uh, if you are on Zoom, then I need everybody to mute your mics. Uh, we will have Q&A at the end, uh, and usually we have uh, quite a while. And uh, But I don't want to be um, doing that in the middle of presenting, because then I lose my I lose my train, and I may never get it back again. And uh, the goal this year is get all the way through the Torah and learn a little bit more as we go. If we do it again next year, then we'll learn even more. Because it's like a book that that uh, grows and grows in uh, layers of that which you're able to learn. Okay? All right, we're going to begin with the Hebrew that is in the lesson and uh, learning five more words. And if you want to cover up the English with your hand or whatever, then uh, then we'll see if you figure out how to pronounce the words. Okay? So number one is an Aleph and a Hait and a Dalit. Okay? That would be, you know it's got a d in it because that's the Hait and the Dalit are going to be Chad, Chad, okay? And the Aleph is going to have an E. Put that all together, what do you got? Echad, Echad, which means one, okay? And you know that from Shema Yisrael, Yehovah Eloheinu, Yehovah Echad. Okay, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Okay, now this next word, man, if you are Jewish or Middle East in your uh, background, you'll be able to do better with this word than I am. Okay, you have a Lamed and a Kaf and a Chait. And that means it's going to be la la Feel bad for whoever's going to use the mic next. <coughs> okay, and it's ah, so it's la kach, la kach, and it means take. Okay. All right. The next word is a yod and a dalit and an ayin. The ayin is usually silent. There is a vowel noise that it's going to make, which is going to be ah. And in Hebrew, if you don't know the vowel, uh, use ah, okay, because you're likely to get it right, all right? This word is, anybody, uh, well, you've already seen it, so it's yada, 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 ah, yada, okay? Yada means no. <coughs> Adam, yada, his wife, Eve. Or Hava, he knew her. God, Yada, us. He knows us. All right? Okay, the next word is an Ayin, a Lamed, and a Hey. Anybody have a guess without looking and reading it in English? Anybody have a guess? Allah. Allah. Now, that isn't the Allah that is the Muslim Allah. But it is that word. Sounds like that word, Allah, and it means go up, to go up, Allah. Those, those who move to Israel make Aliyah, which is root Allah, which means go up. So they go up to Israel. You always go up to Israel. You go up uh, to Jerusalem. So Allah, go up. And the last word is an easy one, a sheen, and a noon, and a hey. Sh-na, sh-ana, sh 
Ana, which means year, as in Rosh Hashanah, head the year, or head of the year, Rosh Hashanah. Hi. You may have more than one in your hand. I don't know. That may be the only one left. It looked like you had uh, thickness there. <coughs> All right, now, here's the deal with the reading, okay? I have not practiced the reading. So we're going to read it together, uh, see how I do and how we do, and then, uh, and then see if maybe you can uh, figure out where I got it, what Bible verse it is. It is a Bible verse that you know it is in Torah, and you know it very well. Okay? And it goes like this. So we're going to read right to left. Wah-ha-aretz. Wah-ha-aretz. Or v-ha-aretz. Hai-yi. I just meant hai-ti. Hai-ti. Ohu vabohu vahoshek al pene to just a minute to ohum varvach Elohim marahef et al pene hamayim. So you guys all know what verse that is, right? What? I heard Genesis 1 what? Genesis 1 verse 2. Okay? And the earth, v-ha-aretz. Remember, the earth is eretz, right? Eretz, we learned that word. So now you have v in the beginning of it. The, the vav there means and, okay? The hey means what? What does it mean when you have hey at the beginning of a word? The. The. It's the article, the. Okay? So, earth is eretz. Vaha eretz means and the earth. And the earth. Okay? Hayat e. That's a form of the verb to be, and it's is. Tohu va bohu. Tohu is a word that means empty. Bohu is a word that means void and chaotic. So they mean similar ideas, and they rhyme, and they're meant to rhyme. Genesis 1 rhymes. Okay, so when you hear, you don't hear that in the English. And the earth was, well, how does it go, uh, dark and void, or the earth was empty and void. All right, in Hebrew, it's v'aretz tohu v'abohu. Anyway, um, <coughs> you want me to keep going? Okay, keep going. Okay, rem you might remember the word. I know I've used it on Friday night. Vahoshek. Vahoshek. That's uh, and. There's the vav that means and. Darkness or dark. And that is the dark that isn't only like there's no light bulb in the room. That's the darkness of chaos and uh, evil, in a way. Evil might be strong. It's the darkness that has not been enlightened with knowledge. Darkness. Like, people live in darkness. The last letter is a uh, off but it's in the final letter of the word, and it's one of those letters that changes at the end of a word. Okay? Alp-ne. Alp 
Ne. Al is uh, means on. <coughs> ne means face. <coughs> so when you hear about the presence of God, it isn't. It doesn't mean presence. It means face. Okay. So when you hear about the presence of God, it's that word. It means God's face. No, that's a different word. Uh, spirit is the word ruach, which means wind or breath. And what do you do when you breathe? You, we know this from living with viruses. You get your air out onto whatever else you're breathing on. But more importantly, what you must do when you speak is breathe. You release air and you release a word. So the idea, the ruach, the spirit, the breath of God is what is the vehicle of his words. Which is why you read in the New Testament that the main job of the Holy Spirit is to help you obey his words. Which, you know, that makes complete sense. We'll go into that another night or another day. But good questions. Okay, where are we? Uh, uh, on the face. Okay. Just a minute. I, I'm not remembering a couple words. That, that happens even to me. We'll just skip them. <laughs> to, to home. Vara, varach. I mean, Varoch Elohim. Marachefet. Al Pne Hamayim. Okay, va-ruach, that's the word spirit. Okay, so and the spirit. Va-ruach, it's the vav and the resh and the vav and the chet. Va-ruach, Elohim. And the spirit of Elohim, marahefet, is like hovered. Okay, alpne, there's that word again. What does that mean? On the face, ha mayim, the water. Genesis 1 2. Now, if you wrote all that down, then you can go home and read it. And the next week I can ask, and you can read it out loud. I've had uh, people memorize it and uh, come back the next week and. Uh, just quote the verse in Hebrew. None of those people are here tonight. <coughs> anyway. All right. We're going to move on into the reading. And uh, this week's reading is, in a way, it's really neat. In another way, it isn't easy to read. I don't know about you, but when I buy something like I bought a, a month ago, we bought these big shelf units that we were going to uh, uh, build in a closet in our house. And we get it. And as usual, where do you begin? Get out the directions. I have learned this now, okay, at my age. I have now learned read the directions because I built things backwards. And I even built it backwards reading the directions. But only one little area. And I it right away all right but reading directions uh, is not what a lot of us uh, would do just enjoy enjoying reading well let's go read the directions on how to build a blah 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 and that's exactly what your reading is okay and almost all the rest of Exodus is directions you're reading directions you're reading in a way you're reading blueprints that are in words. So at the end of your notes, I, incl 
included a diagram of what you're reading about, okay? And that little uh, model that was being handed around there, that's, that's the permanent version of the tabernacle, okay? They built it like the tabernacle, but with walls and everything. Thank you, Dean. If you guys online, there's the little model. If you want to see, somebody gave me this nice little model, and I'll hold it up thus. There you go. And put it back together again. <coughs> so, oh, is that right? Whatever, whatever works. Whatever works with you guys. Holding it farther away, close up. All right, we'll uh, see how that goes. Now, what this is all about is in Hebrew, the word is the Mishkan which literally means the dwelling place, okay? Remember, Yehovah desires to, to dwell with Israel, okay? He wants to live among them. But if he's going to live among them, he's going to need, in a way, he's going to need a house. Now, we know the house doesn't contain Elohim, okay? It doesn't hold him in. It doesn't limit him in any way. But what it does, what all of this does that we're reading about, yes, it will end up providing a way that they might be forgiven, okay? They really, all of the offerings that are about that really worked, and they really were forgiven. And you might ask, well, then why did, why did we need Yeshua? If the animals worked, but the animals only worked to bring you f forgiveness. The animals did not work. In, in Hebrews, we read, uh, they didn't work to clean your mind and your conscience. Okay, which is what Yeshua did. When he gave his life, not only was it the once and for all life that was given as a sin sacrifice, but it cleanses your inner being in a way that bulls and lambs were never able to do. But what the bulls and lambs are going to do and what the Mishkan is going to do is it's going to give us a living picture of where God is going with all of this. Okay? Um, it, in, in the tabernacle, we learn that Yehovah is holy. You notice there are like levels that you go through, okay, to get into the holy of holies, which is the most intimate area in the dwelling place, in the Mishkan, okay? But you'll notice as well, and you'll learn this as we go over the notes tonight, that not only do we learn that he is holy, but he is very merciful, very merciful. And ever since the beginning, well, uh, we read that the lamb was slain from before the foundation of the world. God made a way before anything even happened, okay, because he wants to dwell with us. Okay, so we'll begin in Exodus 25, verse 1. <coughs> Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Tell Benai Israel to take up an offering for me from anyone whose heart compels him. You are to take my offering. The word that is used here for Offering or contribution is the word teruma, which means a gift that is lifted up, which ought to remind us of the ultimate gift that was lifted up, which is Yeshua, 
And his words in John were, and as I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to my self. So originally, the Mishkan, the tabernacle that was movable, originally it was meant as a way that Yehovah might dwell with Israel, right? Okay. Later on, they're going to build it into a structure with walls and uh, uh, beauty and gold and all of that. And it is designed not only to be a dwelling place that Yehovah might dwell with Israel, but in order to draw all the nations into it or up to it, right? Yeshua said, this will be a house of prayer for all the nations, all the goyim, all the people of the earth. That's the desire of God. Okay, and Israel was to be used in order to bring that light. But then we look in the Messiah, like the Mishkan, if he, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So what you have is you have, you're going to have a, a building, but the building means a lot more than the building. Okay? All right. Now, notice that the offering that was given, we read in the version that we read that it was those whose heart moved them or compelled them to give. This offering was not a requirement. Okay, there are offerings that are required of all Israelites. Okay, tithes are required. Can you uh, think of anything else? Yes? Yes, the redemption of the firstborn was required as was the annual uh, money that you gave in order to run the temple. Okay, that's her requirement. This was not. This was a free will offering to anyone that wanted to give. And uh, that reminds us of the words of Paul when he wrote in Corinthians let each one give as he is decided in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. Why? Because God loves a, say with me, cheerful giver. Now, how many of you have heard that verse used in the way of tithes? All of us. That verse is not about tithes. Okay, that verse is about a gift that Paul was going to bring uh, into Jerusalem where there were poor believers, and he was going all around uh, the rounds of Asia gathering up these offerings that he might bring them and lift them up in Jerusalem so they'd have enough to eat. Okay, In that way, God loves a cheerful giver. And that doesn't mean that he doesn't love a cheerful giver when you tithe. But what happens is we get this idea, well, I don't, I don't want to do it tonight, so I'm not going to do it because I'm not cheerful about it. Ah, okay, because you're mixing up an offering and a requirement. So just thought I'd bring that up, not because I want your money, because I want us to be obedient in all ways. That's the desire, okay? Now, the other thing is, Yehovah wanted the whole project to be one that would be joyful, that would, be, that would bring joy. I mean, think about it this. The God who delivered you wants to dwell with you. There were no gods in Egypt that wanted that, okay? So it was going to be the ultimate symbol of God's gracious and holy presence in the midst of Israel. Now, he begins to line out what he wants them to bring. 
And did you ask while you were reading it, where did they get all this? These were slaves in Egypt. Where did they get all this bronze and silver? And Ah, they got it from Egypt. Remember, when they left, it was as if they plundered the Egyptians. The Egyptians gave it willingly. They were like, here, get out of here. Take my ox and some gold and this weaving loom and these ironworking tools. Take them. You know, and maybe the Israelites were looking and going, I don't know, maybe I could use that. And their Egyptian friends were like, take it. Anyway, these are the contributions which you are to receive from them. Gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet cloth, fine linen, and goat hair, ram skins dyed red, seal skins, acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and the sweet incense, onyx stones, and setting stones for the ephod and the breastplate. It's very interesting. There are seven categories of gifts that Yehovah wanted them to bring. There's that number again. Right? And there are the categories. There's metals. There's dyed cloth. There's fabrics. There's wood. There's oil. There's spices. And there's gems. Okay? Whenever in the Bible you hear the number seven, your mind goes all the way back in the beginning. Elohim created the heavens and the earth, and go through the days till you get down to that seventh day. Okay, that's what your mind ought to be thinking about. All right? And it's interesting, and I read this, according to the Talmud, iron is not one of the materials that were used. And the reason is that iron was used to make weapons of war, which are going to have no place in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle. I thought that was interesting. Okay? Now, the colors that are going to be used, they're very significant. Okay? Blue represents the heavens. Okay? Sky is blue. So blue is and blue's going to go over it. Blue represents the heavens. All right. Purple is royalty. And one of the reasons why was it was very it was a dye that was very hard to make and very rare, which meant it was very pricey. Okay? So it's what royalty used. And scarlet represents blood which represents man. Because the word man in Hebrew is Adam. The word blood in Hebrew is Dam. Okay? So man, blood is uh, a root of the word man. So man is man is Adam. Blood is Dam. If you want to think of it that way. Dam. Adam, Dam. Blood. Okay? And the blood is going to be what is atoned for in the Mishkan, okay? So then, verse 8, have them make a sanctuary for me so that I may dwell among them, okay? These words are neat. The word sanctuary is mikdash, which is from the root kodesh, and that means holy. Sometimes when we gather to worship, sometimes you you sing the word holy, holy, okay? Only it's not the noun, it's the verb. And w- so we go, kadosh, 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 holy, 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 okay? That I may dwell is the word vashakanti, which is from the root word shakan, which means settle down and dwell. 
settle down. It's like a husband looking at his wife and going, are you ready to settle down? Even though they're going to be moving, you know, the goal is to arrive in the land and then they won't be moving around anymore, right? Okay, so we already looked at where Israel got all of these gifts, all right? Um, but we want to remember that there's a, the reason why Israel, if you want to use the word plundered Egypt, wasn't that they might be rich. And, so, and Israel might have, oh, now, geez, we got, we got everything the Egyptians got. Look at us. That wasn't the reason at all. The reason was that I may dwell among them. Yehovah was going to use all of that in order to build his dwelling place. Their gifts were to be a loving response to what Yehovah had done for them. And their gifts would show that they wanted Yehovah to live with them and be married to him. Okay? In that way, God wants us to give ourselves to him that he might live in us. We are his ultimate mishkan, right? To live in us. He is good. He wants to transform our lives, but he will not do it without involving us in the process. You, don't you think that the Elohim that made the heavens and the earth could have looked down and gone, all right, all you guys, back up. Whew, there's, a, there's my dwelling place. He, he easily could have built this, right? I mean, he made the heavens and the earth. He, as we learned Friday night, he breathes and stars are born. So easily he could have made this dwelling place, but he wasn't going to make it. They were going to make it. He was going to give them the directions on how to do it, but it was up to them to do it. He even breathed into the craftsmen. Okay, you, did you remember when you read that with ba ba Bazalel? Ba yeah, the guy's name that was the major uh, the expert in building that it was the Ruach, Elohim, that breathed into him the wisdom. This is just like our life and our walk with God, isn't it? God wants to build a house. He's not going to do it without you. It's not like you walk down an aisle and you go, I believe in Jesus. And then he just magically says, now move over. I'm going to build my house in you. Whoosh, and it's done. No. We've got to build it. He gives us the raw materials, and he gives us directions on how to do it. But then it's up to us whether we're going to do it or not, right? Okay. Um, now, the items that they got from Israel, I mean from Egypt, even though they were valuable, they were not rare. Gold was not rare. Okay? So what does that mean? That means the items that they removed out of Egypt were not holy. They were just gold, bronze, cloth, uh, dye, w whatever it was. It just the things of earth, okay, wood, whatever it was. But when the directions were hollowed and God took up residence in them, it, they, all of those items, were made holy. Which reminds you that you are to be made holy. Right? Okay? And the uh, fact that it was movable, it was portable, reminds us that God is not limited to one location like the other gods of the other nations. They were limited in where they were able to go. Okay, verse 9 of 25. Uh, God says to Moses, You are to make it all precisely. 
according to everything that I show you, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the furnishings within, just so you must make it. Wow, seems like God's a little picky there, doesn't it? Well, let me ask, if you were going to build your own airplane, would you want to do it right? If you had directions, would you follow the directions? Or would you look at them and go, I don't know, I don't think I need that gear, whatever it is. I, I don't think I need that. No, you wouldn't do that. Okay. Now, this ought to let us know, and I'm going to be going over this a little bit Friday night. It ought to let us know that we are, we are to keep the instructions as closely as we are able. Okay? That is not legalism. Legalism in the tabernacle idea isn't building it right following the directions legalism would be the belief that by building the tabernacle god delivered them out of egypt you're giving me blank looks in other words god delivered them out of egypt and all they had to do was put the blood of the lamb on the door and get up and go once he delivered them, he gave them his instructions. Now he's giving them the instructions of how to live among them, and the, they're to build it exactly like the instructions. It has nothing to do with whether they're saved or not. They already were. Okay? In other words, Torah, although its ideas would make any nation better or any human being better, Torah is written for those who have been delivered. Okay, it's not given to everybody to just go, here, everybody do this right now. It's written to those who've already been brought out of Egypt, okay? In other words, it's the way we live as his people, okay? So, now, remembering that this is a picture, if you will, of God's kingdom, his dwelling place on earth as in heaven. So it needs, it needs to be built exactly by Yehovah's instructions, not our own. This is very important. Okay? The idea is that Moses went up to the mountain and he was given a vision of heaven. And in heaven, there is a tabernacle. And he looked at it, and then he wrote it down, and then he was to bring that writing and that vision down and build on earth what was in heaven. And Yeshua's words were on earth as it is in heaven, right? That's the desire, and this is a picture of it, okay? This is why, oh, by the way, in Hebrews, you read about this in Hebrews 8, verse 5, okay? They, meaning the priests, they offer service in a replica, a model, okay? That is a foreshadower of the heavenlies. One that is just as Moses was instructed by God when he was about to complete Complete the tabernacle. For he says, see that you make everything according to the design that was shown to you on the mountain. Okay? So there's that idea of the design. Now here's the bottom line, and this is what matters. And this is a, this is a good um, subject with those who want to debate about how you worship and what you believe and yada yada, all that. Okay, and it's this. You cannot build a house for God your way. Because then you're building a house for you. You're not building a house for God. 
And I know a lot of us have lived a lot of our lives believing in God, but building it our way. And I hear words like, well, you know, I worship God in my own way. Or I believe in God in my own way. So, so on, yada, yada, right? But in reality, those are not good words. I would rather worship God his way rather than my way. I would rather live my life his way rather than my way and then ask him to bless my way. Well, I thought I was doing good. I thought I was doing right. Yeah, but you're not following my teachings. Oh, you mean I need to do that? Yes. We need to do that, okay? There's a lot of believers who are not experiencing all that God has. I mean, the power, the victory, the intimacy, and all of that. And the reason is they're they're doing their best, but they're building it their way. Okay, all right? <coughs> now, let's look at what goes in the tabernacle. You have the ark. Okay, the Ark of the Testimony, otherwise known as the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, you have a table that'll be the bread of the presence, which means the bread of the face. Okay, uh, you have a menorah, or in English, it's a lampstand, which I always thought of as, a, you know, like the lamps that you see in mansions and things like that. No, this was a menorah. It was the menorah. Okay? Curtains that are going to be used to wall off different areas um, and an altar. All right? Now, there's going to be more added as we read on in Exodus, but that's what we have to deal with now tonight. Okay? Now, it's made, as you already probably know, the tabernacle, the dwelling place, is made in three with three areas of holiness. All right, one and the most holy is the holy of the holies. Okay, or the most holy place. Then you, <coughs> then you have <coughs> the holy place. <coughs> Excuse me. And then you have the courtyard. Now, you can uh, think of it like this, that the tabernacle being a model of us, okay, we are spirit and soul and body, right? Body is the outer area of, of you, okay? That's like the courtyard, all right? Soul is like your thoughts and your emotions and your will and that's like the holy place and then spirit is almost undefinable other than your wind your breath your innermost being that's the holy of holies okay so we're gonna begin with the ark which is in the middle and this is amazing okay the ark is is the uh, a, a h made out of acacia wood, which has a different name, <coughs> but I don't remember the different name. It's a tree with horns that was used to build uh, fences around sheep at night. So A, they wouldn't get out, and B, other animals wouldn't get in. Okay? Now, in the ark, there's going to be the and words, all right, and that really is the heart of Torah, is the ten words. They're going to be in the ark, and they're going to be covered and protected by that wood. It's going to be overlaid with gold, but it's wood nonetheless, right? Okay, now, very interesting, this wood grew in the desert, grew in very dry ground, that means the container of God's word is going to be made from a tree that's roots grow from dry ground. Isaiah, that, he grew about Messiah. He grew up before him like a 
tender shoot like a root out of dry ground. Okay? The wood of the ark is going to be overlaid with gold. Gold is the mineral of royalty, but the ark is made of wood, which is like humanity. It's wood, it's normal, it's everywhere, and it's going to be covered with gold. Okay? The ark, the chest of the ark, is going to have a lid that is literally placed on the ark from above. Okay? This lid or covering is known in English, we know it as the mercy seat. In Hebrew, it's kaparet, and it means a own cover ransom. On this covering, the blood of the sacrifice is going to be poured out. Okay? Is that not a great picture of what happens right in here with us and Yeshua. It's amazing. God is amazing. When I read all of this and I begin to dig into it, I begin to realize how I don't know how anybody would not believe. You know, it's like he's telling them that I want you to make this and I want it to look like this. And then thousands of years later, they're writing, oh, this was about Jesus. This was about Yeshua. And he did this and he did that. And it's 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 amazing. It's beautiful. OK, so thousands of years later, John writes uh, in in your normal English version, you read he is the atonement for our sins in the Jewish Bible. He is the kapara. So if you want to think of it like this, think of it. The lid on the ark is Yeshua. He is the mercy seat. OK. Now, notice that the mercy seat, when it is laid on the ark and the ark, which is going to have in it the Torah or the, the ten words, they make one unit, and they're not to be separated. They weren't to go in and lift the lid and look, okay? The reason it's going to have a lid is carrying it, but it was meant to be one unit all together with those in them. The uh, fact that the mercy seat is over the ark and covering the ark is to let you know that Yehovah's instructions and the ten words are only meant to be accessed by or through the mercy seat. Otherwise, you're just going to be guilty. So you have the words. You know that you can do the words. Moses says the words are not far away. They're not unavailable for you to do. Uh, John, a thousand years later, writes, they're not burdens. His commandments are not burdensome. And yet every one of us has missed the mark. Right? In our life, every one of us has missed the mark. you got to go through Yeshua. I am the door. I am the way. If you want to get in where God's instructions are and you want to be empowered in order to be helped with those instructions, you've got to begin with the way, the truth, the life, Yeshua. Okay? Now, here's something else. The mercy seat <coughs> is going to have on it, all right, these cherubim that are over it and looking at one another and acting, if you will, as a guard. Guards. That's what they look like. They look like they're guarding the ark. Okay, and what is in the ark? The words of God. The ten words are in the ark. Okay, think with me now. Back in the garden, in the Garden of Eden, 
okay? Man and woman had relationship with God. They walked with God in the cool of the evening. And God put a tree in the garden that was very special. It's known as the Etz Hayim, the tree of life. They were allowed to eat of it. Okay? Uh, I guess they didn't, but they were allowed to eat of it because they were allowed to eat any tree in the garden. But there was another tree in the garden that was known as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? And you know what happened, right? Okay? You have the Etz Hayim, the tree of life. You eat of it, you live. Did you know that in the Torah, the Torah, I mean, in the, in the Tanakh, in the Bible, the tree of life is the Torah. Okay, so just let this uh, sit there for a minute. Okay, so when the man and the woman ate from the, no the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what they were literally doing is they were saying, your words, God, we do not believe. We have the ability to determine what is right and what is wrong. We will do that. So they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of life, the Etz Hayim, was no longer available to them, right? Until there is an art, there's a mountain, and God speaks from the mountain his words, his commandments, and he puts them in the middle of an ark, and the ark is protected or guarded by cherubim, and the only way to get in there is the mercy seat. Now, remember what happened in the garden. Adam and Eve were expelled out of the garden, but God did something. Right then, do you remember what he did? He placed two cherubim in order to guard the way back to the Etz Hayim. So now you have this picture of these cherubim in the garden. They're guarding the way back to the tree of life. And now you have this ark that is going to be built with cherubim that are guarding the way to the tree of life. So here it is back here. Here it's going to be in the ark. And then in the book of Revelation, at the very end of the word, the book of Revelation, there's a river flowing out of the new Jerusalem. And you read about that river in Revelation 22. On either side of the river, was an Etz Hayim, the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Isn't that gorgeous? And not in my notes, but just in my mind right now. If you go back to Isaiah, in Isaiah, it speaks of the nations of the world, the Goyim, the Gentiles, and they all want to go up to the mountain of God where his temple is. Why? Because out of his temple flows his Torah, and they all want to know, and they all want to obey, and it's through knowing his Torah that they beat their swords into plowshares, and they practice war no more. I mean, it's blows me away. Okay, I went ahead without even reading. So uh, where am I in my notes? I don't know. Genesis 3, he expelled the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he had cherubim dwell there with swirling sword of flame to guard the way to the tree of life. Okay. All right. Now, let's uh, move on a little bit, I think. 
All right. The ark, which is the art, okay, the spirit, is known as the testimony of Yehovah, which has the ten words in it. But it's going to have something else. It's going to have Aaron's rod that budded that we'll go over when we get to that. And it's going to have a pot of manna, the bread that they ate while they were in the wilderness. And you remember, this bread points to the word of God. Because in Deuteronomy, you read that Yehovah gave them bread, manna, in order to make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of Adonai. So, see how this is all related. It's all related, and it's beautiful the way that it's all related. Okay, out of all the words of the Torah, only the ten words are to be placed in the ark, which reveals that those words are the foundation of how you love God and how you love your neighbor. Begin there, okay? Don't, you know, I, I people who want to walk in Torah, where does everybody want to begin? What do they want to begin with? Yes. What, what, what do you think everybody wants to begin with? They're convinced Torah is for me. No, well, yes, that's one, Shabbat. But Shabbat is one of the words, one of the ten words. Eating is not. But people want to begin with eating. All right, that's it. No more bacon. Right? Okay, and I'm like, well, you can do that if you want. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you really want a good beginning, go back to the ten words. Begin there. Okay, then when you get to the eating, you'll know that eating is related to word two, that you're not to have any idols in your life, even what you eat. See? So there's an order in there is what I'm getting at with these words. Okay, um, uh, last about the ark, bottom of your notes on uh, seven, uh, you read about the wings of the cherubim spreading above, shielding or guarding the mercy seat with their wings, okay? So that means the wings of the cherubim shield the mercy seat. The mercy seat shields the ark, and the ark shields the ten words. And the ten words shield us, human life and human civilization, as we know it. <coughs> All right, next you will make a table. So let's look at this idea of the table. In Hebrew, it's shulchan. And it is from the word that we get a uh, sent one or apostle. How is that related to the table? In Hebrew, the table was the very center of your family and where you would learn Torah. Not only from your father, but your mother as well. On this table in the ark were 12 loaves of bread that were the bread of the presence, okay? And we learn that only by partaking of the word of God are we going to be sent out to be light of the world. By the way, the light is there as well, and we're going to look at that uh, next. OK, so the mission is make the instructions of God known to those who do not know. And it's only by the word of God that our minds are transformed, which is what Paul wrote about. Right. Don't be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you'll know what God wants you to do. You'll know what the will of God is. OK. So now let's look at the menorah. You are to make a menorah of pure gold by hammered work. Its base, ten cups, bulbs, and flowers are to be one piece. 
Excuse me one second here. So the golden lamp or the menorah is made of six branches that branch off of a middle. And the middle is often a little bit raised up from the other branches. The middle is known as the shamash, which means the servant. And the reason is that all of the other branches that branch out to get oil, they get it from the middle branch. The middle branch is where in, in this menorah where the oil goes. The oil goes through the servant and branches out to the other lights. Well, that's a little bit symbolic, isn't it? Okay. Another word of that middle candle or lamp is the Shabbat lamp. Because we think of it at the end of the week, right? Which, in a way, it is. Seventh day. But it ought to be at the middle of our lives. The very center of our lives. Okay? And it is a picture of Yeshua and his word that gives light into the holy place where they're eating the word of God. Okay? So we read in Psalms, your word is a lamp and a light, a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It helps me know how to walk, how to go. John wrote in his letter, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of his son Yeshua purifies us from all sin. So here's something neat. Uh, you may remember in Luke 4, Yeshua goes into this God, and he reads. He reads from Isaiah. Remember that? And as he reads, the way it was structured in a synagogue is he would have been in the middle, okay, uh, on a raised platform, and there would have been three ministers on his left and on his right. The one in the middle who was going to read the word was known as the Shamash, the same as the middle branch or the middle uh, uh, lamp in the menorah. And it looked like that. Pretty neat. When um, my wife and I visited Italy uh, a little over a year ago, one of the things that we noticed in the cathedrals was they all had menorahs, but it was like they were they were where they had lamps. You could look up at the front, and there were th three and three and something in the middle. So in almost every one where we went, it was like, oh, that there's your menorah right there. I don't know that they knew that's what they were doing, but that's what they did. So anyway. All right. The word of God is eaten like bread, and it illuminates or gives light into our minds. Okay, next, the curtains. You are to make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine woven linen of blue, purple, and scarlet with cherubim made by the work of skillful craftsmen. These were going to be the covering of the holy place within the tabernacle. Okay? Now, here's something interesting. I got this. I, I uh, uh, included in your notes where I got these words and this idea. All right. And what is amazing to me is that purple is a combination of blue and red. So you remember blue is the heavens. Red is Adam, blood, ground. Purple royalty is a combination. All right. And it is 100% blue and 100% red, which is amazing since Yeshua was 100% God and 100% man. 
So there's the picture of it right there. Okay, then they were to make uh, clasps of gold um, and the curtains together so that it may all be one piece, which points to the oneness of God. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu. <coughs> Excuse me, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Even though it was, you can take it apart in order to move it, it was meant to look like it was one. One unit. Okay, now we have the altar. We're almost done. Make the altar of acacia wood, five cubits long, five cubits wide. The altar will be square, and its height is to be three cubits. Make horns on the four corners of one piece and overlay it with bronze. So I wrote years ago, bronze is the picture of judgment. So I went back and I read what I wrote and I asked, how do you know that? Hadley, how do you know bronze is the picture of judgment? Okay. The items within the holy place and the holy of holies were to be either made of gold or overlaid with gold. Everything outside was to be bronze. And the bronze altar is where Yehovah's judgment meets sin and deals with it. Only then is an individual allowed to enter into the presence of Yehovah. So bronze is judgment. Okay? The bronze altar was for the daily whole burnt offering. The only way that anyone, priest or anyone, was allowed to go near getting in the tabernacle was through the bronze altar and the sacrifices. And then once it was made, they took the ashes and they used the ashes. They would use the ashes and what we're going to learn about later, the incense bowl that was in the holy place they would use the ashes to mix with the the incense. The incense is known in the book of Revelation as what? There are golden bowls of incense, and they are the prayers of the holy ones, you guys, mixed with the ashes of the animal sacrifice, okay? So there's that idea again. The only way to get into the the words, the ten words, and do them is through the mercy seat. The only way to offer prayers is through Yeshua. He is the, the way. He is the door, the only one. Okay, now. Lastly, these offerings were whole burnt offerings, meaning it wasn't the leg of an animal. It was the whole animal. And the idea is that the word whole in Hebrew is kalil, not kayil. Those are two different words. And it means uh, to be made perfect or complete. A related word, so here's the wholeness of the animal that you're bringing. You're bringing a whole animal. Why? Because you're bringing your whole life. You're not just going to give him your arm or your eye or your leg. You're going to give him your whole life, your whole being. And the word whole, kalil, is related to another word, Allah, which means bride. The bride. Okay? And the message is that those who give themselves wholly to God are his bride. Simple, right? All right, and then you have your uh, your diagram so you can look at where every everything is laid there. So I wonder, in the house, in the room, do you have any questions? And if you do, i got to bring you the mic. Okay, Kathy, your hand was 
raised very gently. Okay. I need to understand guarding versus guiding. Guarding versus guiding? With the cherubim, I thought my impression had always been they were guarding so they couldn't get back there. So they couldn't get back there. Well, my understanding from you talking was they were okay. I get it. All right. In the garden, the cherubim were not guarding the tree of life. They were guarding the way. Okay, so it's like there was a road to get in. They're guarding the road. Why? Because human beings are not ready to go down that road right now. Because if they go down that road and they begin to eat, they're going to live forever, and that wouldn't be good right now. Why? There's no sacrifice. Okay? So now, as he begins uh, to make these uh, sacrifices in the Mishkan, in the Ark, the way now is through the mercy seat, but that hadn't been revealed yet. So now the way, yeah, the way is guarded, but you can get there. How can you get there? There's only one way, and that way is guarded, meaning there's not a whole bunch of other ways that you can get there. Yeah, does that work? Okay. Okay, Bill, bringing you the mic. So the representation of the Ark of the Covenant is not only their past, but their future, in a way. Yes, yeah, and it would be our future as well. Okay, really, it's it's our hearts. Is now in the heavenly, in the heavenly one, in the new heavens and the new earth. What is all that going to be like? I have no idea. I mean, I know, I know what I read in the book of Revelation, but I, I have, I, I, this is one of uh, where Paul writes in his letters. He writes in one of them to the uh, Corinthians, "No eye has seen or ear heard or has it ever entered into the mind of a man what Yehovah has ready and prepared for those who love Him." So, those of you who are brides. And you're going to get married. Let me see. This might not work. Well, it works in an ideal world and an ideal marriage. When a bride is going to get married, she has no idea. She has, a, she has an idea in her mind, but then when it all happens, it's like, wow, this is not like I thought it was going to be. Now, in earthly marriages, because we are fallen, sometimes it's not as good as we hoped it would be. Right? Okay. But this marriage is going to be better than anything that you've ever imagined. So, mind blowing. Okay. Anyway, yep. As let me bring you the mic. Just one a comment and a question. So one comment is that um, Ron Wyatt uh, found proof that the blood of Yeshua actually sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. Yeah, so that's one thing that I, I saw clear, like two years ago or something that I found it. But then the other thing, so the, the, the way back into Eden is guarded. So that means also that the tree of knowledge of good of evil is guarded, right? Well, it's guarded in order that it doesn't get lost. You may go back there. All of you who believe and uh, who trust in Yeshua and are learning to walk in his ways, you are on the road back to the tree of life. You are already beginning to eat of it by living his ways. That's the idea. Okay? Nobody else, only those who will do that are going down that road. Nobody else is going down that road. So, but the guard is not there. The guard is not there to keep you out as much as the guard is there so the way doesn't get lost. There's always a way. There's the, there's the road, the road back. Does that work? Okay. Dana, okay. Why did the priests eat the showbread? 
and second question how uh, is everybody Adam they ate it okay he uh, he asked number one why did the priests eat the bread the sh o bread and second question is everybody the bride okay now Number one, they ate it, I imagine, by just sticking it in their mouth and eating it. Secondly, no. <laughs> Sorry, I mess with you a little bit. <laughs> so, why did they eat it? Well, think about who they are. They're the representatives of, okay, there are two reasons. One reason, okay, has to do with this is their living. This is what they do. God is going to provide for them meals. He's going to give them meat. They, they ate some of those offerings. He's going to give them grain because they ate some of the grain offerings. He's going to give them bread. Okay, But the bigger idea is the priests, which in a way all of us are, must eat the word of God in order to be able to represent Resent him. They m go out of the holy place into the world with the light that is in there. They have to eat the word of God, and we have to eat the word of God if we're going to be his priests. Now, regarding the bride, what I um, think is clear in both the Tanakh and the New Testament is the bride are those who are making themselves ready and pure and the only way to do that is learning how to walk in his ways that's who i think the bride is that doesn't mean that uh, I, I know that we uh, we who grew up in christianity believe that the bride is all believers but that isn't in the word okay so when you go back to the word and you read about the bride and the bride is made herself ready in Revelation, it isn't. And I made the bride ready. It's the bride made herself ready. So that means there's that dual responsibility again. I will give you the, the design on how to build this, but you're going to have to go out and get what is needed to build it. And you're going to have to do the work of building it. I'll help you. I'll give you my ruach, my spirit. Which will help you, but you get you get to build it. Glorious. Okay, I'm wondering if there's anybody on Zoom that has a question, and if you do, you can either go on video and wave your hand, or you can hit that little button that I don't know where it is, but it waves a hand over by your name. Anybody? There's no hands there. Anybody else? Yes. Okay. I'm in your way. Both of your ways. I remembered a scripture that said um, that a road of holiness will be built and only the pure will get on it. So I'm wondering if that's what the Torah is, is that uh, once you get on that road, you can, you can only come if you cleanse yourself like what was displayed with the tabernacle that you have to go before you can't just come up oh, here I am take me God but you have to actually do the process of cleaning yourself out before you I, yes I believe that that is right the way uh, that is mentioned in Isaiah has a name that road has a name the name is the way of holiness okay and the only way to walk in the way of holiness which in Hebrew would be Derek uh, Odesh is walk in his ways. And that's Torah. So, good. Was your hand up, sir? How thick is the curtain? Oh, I don't remember. How thick is the curtain? From what I remember, it's about five inches, six inches, a hand breadth, something like that, depending on how uh, thick your hand is. Oh, all right. Now we have worms. A can of worms. 
opening up. Did they mend it after Yeshua died? Honestly, I don't know. I've never read about that. However, I have read something else recently that it was more than the veil that ripped, that there were in the inherent in the second temple, there were these posts that were built out of uh, marble or something like that. I, I don't remember exactly what they were built out of, but they fell down, and that's what ripped the temple. And there is a uh, symbolism in that, but I don't remember. I don't remember what it is right now. But I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. You'd think that God wouldn't want it remade. Well, that that might be. Um, yeah, that that might be. Well, because it was it was a way of making a picture that the way had been opened into the holy of holies by Yeshua, and in in a lot of ways, it was a new day. It was a new day. Yeah, could be. Right. The That's exactly right. The uh, religious leaders would have wanted it all back together again. Yeah, definitely. And they wouldn't have wanted anybody to know either. Just like they didn't want anybody to know about the rock. They didn't want anybody to know about Yeshua. There's a lot of things they didn't want anybody to know. They were um, polit <laughs> politicians keeping it under the rug. Well, they don't need to know that. So, glad we don't live in a day like that. <laughs> okay, one more. You mentioned about the tree of life and it having leaves for healing the nations. When Yeshua said that I'm the vine and you're the branches, the branches are the ones that hold leaves and the fruit. Any correlation? Yep. That that works, yes. See, all of these, um, sometimes when we read or when we have read the Bible, we have read it disconnected. And all of it is connected like a tree. So when Yeshua gives the words, I am the vine, you are the branches, in your mind, go back to the garden, go to the Torah, go to the Mishkan, go to the book of Revelation. It's bigger than just, I am a tree, here is a branch, and you are the branch, and you got to stick with me. Yes, all of that is true. But that is like a little, a little um, middle of a great big picture. That's a lot more beautiful. So, hallelujah. All right, we'll end the evening. Uh, let's pray. Abba, I am amazed at your words. I am amazed uh, that we have a book that from beginning to end over thousands of years, you watched over in a way that it all works together to bring us nearer to you. And in the middle of it all is Yeshua, our atonement and our example, the living word. We give you glory tonight. Worthy is the Lamb. Amen. Amen. Bless all of you.